What is home? What gives home meaning? Home is where you live, where you're from, or perhaps where you're going. Home defines us in ways that are indelible. Home is language and meaning and connection. In the digital age, it is our urge to connect that makes us human, an urgency to be understood, to have a voice. This human connection defines SmartLink. We are not a suite of products or a nexus of technology, but rather we are the sum of our people, places, and pursuits. It's what defines us and sets us apart from everyone else. An understanding and appreciation of the human connection, the bond we share over meaning, and the power of words to bring us all together on the same page. Every day in places all over the world, we employ and empower translators to bring home meaning and breathe life into content. Content that connects people and places, moving the world with words. Let's bring home meaning and work together to move the world with words. Hi, my name is Uwe Mügge, and I'm going to begin my presentation with a personal story that I haven't shared with anyone yet. And I believe that the facts that I'm going to disclose to you in the next few minutes will shed some light on the state of the localization industry, and quite possibly, the world that we live in as a whole. You know how I got invited to this fabulous event? For the past 10 years, I've been saying I'm a terminology expert, and I've been saying it loud enough and often enough that people finally believe it. And that's probably the reason why GALA, the Globalization and Localization Association, asked me to contribute to a new project they call Ask the Experts. The first installment in the series that was just published a short while ago was about terminology and artificial intelligence. We'll come back to this blog post in a moment. But first, another piece of information you need to know to fully appreciate my story. A few years back, when I was still teaching full time, I started posting links to job opportunities on Twitter to help my students get started in the language industry. After I left academe a few years later, that project took on a life of its own. And today, about 15,000 linguists from all over the world follow me on Twitter. Now, let me introduce you to Tazzy. Tazzy and I share a passion for running. And so whenever my daughter, who actually owns Tazzy, and lives a little over an hour away uh, in Silicon Valley, whenever she can spare Tazzy, we go on long runs in Fort Ord, a park that's only a, a stone's throw from where I live near Monterey. And whenever Tazzy is here, we, do not, we not only run together, I also post photos of our adventures on Twitter, like this shot of Tazzy running her first half marathon. Now, back to the gala post. As I mentioned before, I have one of the largest networks of linguists on social media. And I have been wondering for some time what my professional network would respond more favorably to. The announcement of a unique, hot of the press article written by some of the most respected authorities in the field, or a post that featured yet another, not even very good photo of a doggy out and about. Now remember, we are not talking about Twitter in general but posting these two tweets on an account that is dedicated to the translation field, where the vast majority of followers are language professionals. So what do you think? Which tweet did better, dog or terminology? Okay, we've started on a lighthearted note. Now let's get serious about terminology management. In the next 30 minutes or so, I'll give you a few good reasons for managing terminology, and they're probably not the ones you have been hearing so far. And I'll follow that discussion with a couple of suggestions for getting started with terminology management that don't require a lot of resources. But first, let me answer the question that I suspect many of you are most curious about. How did DASI do against the terminologists? 
And the answer is, while the two tweets both got a little more than a thousand views each, the doggy tweet got almost 200 clicks, likes, and retweets versus 20 for the terminology tweet. And that's the first bombshell of my presentation today. Cute dog beats terminology 10 to 1. And quite honestly, I'm still reeling from this revelation, and I leave it to you to draw your own conclusions from this highly scientific experiment. Now, let's dive right into terminology. Terminology management and terminologists. In my experience, if you ask two terminologists to define a term, any term, you are guaranteed to get a minimum of three different answers. And so it shouldn't come as a surprise that there are many definitions for even the most basic concepts in this field. For example, if you consult the relevant ISO standard, ISO 1087, Terminology Work and Terminology Science, issued in 2019, it will tell you that a term is, and I quote, a designation that represents a general concept by linguistic means. And the majority of my terminologists I know use this or a similar definition when they talk to regular people about terminology management. But even the graduate students in my terminology management class told me that academic definitions were not very helpful for practical terminology work. So I came up with my own definition of what a term is, and it goes a little bit like this. A term is a word or phrase that matters to you in your organization. This is the simplest definition I can think of. If you care about a word enough that you want everyone in your organization to use only that word when you talk about that thing, that word is a term. It's as easy as that. And now that we have a simple definition of what a term is, let's try and define terminology management. I've been a, num a member of ISO Technical Committee 37 for many years, and this is the Standards Committee for Language and Terminology. And that's why I want to reference another brand new ISO standard, ISO 29383, Terminology Policies, Development and Implementation, that defines terminology management as, and I quote, methods for collecting, maintaining, and accessing terminology data. What's nice about this definition is that you don't need an advanced degree in linguistics to understand it. While it doesn't sound overly academic, in my opinion, this definition still applies more to academic terminology work than to terminology management in a business context. Because quite, frank, uh, quite frankly, in the 20 years that I've been active as a terminologist, I have not seen a single business that's collecting terminology data just for the sake of building a term collection. So here's my definition of commercial terminology management. It's the process of providing guidance on word choice to authors and translators. That's what I and my teams do. We help content creators throughout the entire life cycle, from authors to reviewers to translators and translation editors, choose the right words. And I should add, choose the right words efficiently because really, that's job number one. Enable content creators pick the right word without doing a lot of research or having endless discussions with coworkers. That's why, unlike many of my colleagues, I don't say my job is to create term bases, because quite frankly, term bases are just one of the tools that I use to provide guidance on word choice. Others are creating naming conventions for products and product descriptions, writing style guides, configuring automatic terminology and style checkers, and of course, providing training in, on how to take full advantage of these resources to anyone who's involved in content creation. Now that we're clear about the two most basic concepts of terminology management, let me share my view of what should go into a term base. Again, the objective of building a term base is to provide guidance on the words that matter in an organization. In my opinion, the most important entry, a term that should not be missing from any term base, is the name of your company. And this topic is actually more complex than it may seem because there are so many ways you can create variants of even the simplest company name. Write it in all capital letters, 
write it with or without the legal form, with or without a comma between name and legal form. Use the ticker symbol for publicly traded companies. Use short forms or abbreviated forms, and the list goes on and on. So always, always include the name of your organization in your term base with detailed usage notes for all use cases. Next, include the names of all your products and at least their key features, because these are words that not only you care about, but also your customers. And so translators need to get them right every time. That part is self-explanatory, I hope. The part that doesn't seem to be self-explanatory uh, self is the inclusion of trademarks in the term base. I have bolded, italicized, and underlined trademarks, and I would have written them in all caps if that wasn't considered rude. As many of you know, registering a trademark is a long and expensive process. And yet, many organizations fail to include this critical type of intellectual property in their term base. And that causes all kinds of problems in translation. This may come as a surprise, but not every translator is familiar with international copyright law. In fact, even among experienced translators, few are. So it is not common knowledge that trademarks lose their legal protection when they are used in any form other than the one that's registered. And that includes translation. What makes matters even worse is the practice of using the trademark symbol after a trademark only on first usage in a document and not using that symbol thereafter. So the risk of trademarks being mishandled during translation is very real. And the most effective and efficient way to make sure that trademarks survive translation intact is to add them to your term base. What else should you add to your term base? Well, ideally any key term that is or should be used across content types or functional groups. For example, it's not uncommon that software strings, online help, and tutorials are translated by different teams and that translators don't always have access to the software or screenshots. In those cases, it is critical to have all UI items available in a term base to ensure that the same terms are translated the same way across all components of a project. Now, here's a little exercise that I use as an icebreaker in my terminology workshops to demonstrate the need to, man to manage terminology. I show this slide and ask people to write down on the post-it note the proper name of the item they see on the screen, and then I read out loud the post-it notes. And every single time, even with just a handful of participants, I get multiple different answers. USB stick, flash drive, thumb drive, jump drive, to name just a few. And the thing is, they are all correct. These are all correct terms for this item. But if everyone in an organization uses their preferred correct term, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to picture the chaos and confusion this situation will cause internally, not to mention with customers and suppliers. Okay, managing terminology improves consistency, and that means the quality of your product and the quality of your customer's experience of your product. Everybody knows that. What I want to talk about today is how terminology management can have an even more immediate impact on the success of your products and services in the marketplace. Let me begin with something you probably are all too familiar with. Inconsistent, incorrect, or otherwise problematic terminology is the number one reason for rework and translation localization projects. The numbers you are seeing on your screen come from a research study that SDL conducted in 2016. They asked more than 2,000 participants in 115 countries what the three most common reasons for rework were and 48% named terminology as the top cause. And that shouldn't surprise anyone. Now imagine for a moment that we took care of the terminology issue. How would that change things? The most promising effect terminology management can have is that it can reduce the time it takes to get your products to market, both domestically and internationally. 
I know that's a big claim to make, but if you look at how content is developed and translated, terminology plays a critical role. And whether an organization manages or not can have a significant impact on every stage of the content lifecycle. I'm telling you a secret now. As an in-house terminologist, I have spent more years supporting authors, both in technical and marketing departments, than supporting translators. That's also true for my current role, where I'm responsible for a terminology program in a global marketing organization of roughly a thousand people. And this is the situation that I found when I first joined, which is very similar to how I have seen content being handled in many other organizations. Without a terminology program in place, writers spend a lot of time researching and debating what the right terms are. And the more teams create content and the more distributed these teams are, the more time research and reconciliation takes. Time that would be better spent creating more content. In those organizations that are fortunate enough to have editors, a lot of their valuable time is spent on correcting and homogenizing terminology. Time that would be better spent improving tone and voice and, of course, editing more content. Now, on the content creation side, the issue is typically consistency or using the same word for the same thing. When it comes to translation, it's not only about consistency, but more often than not about getting it right or absolutely wrong. And finding the right term can be hard, even for the most highly trained translators with many years of experience. I know from personal experience about the pressure translators feel when they're asked to meet impossible deadlines and getting paid by the word, both of which make it prohibitive to spend more than a few seconds on finding the right translation for a term. And finding the right term gets more difficult the bigger a project is, the more types of translation, software strings, print copy, audiovisual content, and service providers that project involves. So even when using the latest translation technology, translators can spend a lot of time finding the right translation of a term. Time that would be better spent translating more content. And just like source language editors, translation reviewers, if they're used, spend much of their time fixing terminology errors, time that would be better spent on making the translation read or sound, well, less than a translation. The bottom line is, all of this friction that the lack of terminology management introduces into the content lifecycle means that it takes longer than necessary to develop content in the source and target language. And that may have a very real impact on your launch calendar. Now back to our thought experiment. How would having end-to-end project-specific terminology management in place, how would that change things? What if all key terms were available to content creators at the beginning of each of their projects? To make that happen, terminologists work with product managers and senior writers and editors to define the key terms and taglines at the planning stage of a launch. And they capture the decisions the group makes as entries in a shared online dictionary that's available to the entire organization. And that dictionary is the source of truth in all terminology matters. And again, the dictionary makes project terminology available before the first line of code, marketing or e-learning content for that project is written. And immediately after the entries are published in the source language, the project dictionary gets passed on to the translation service providers so that they can properly research and validate term translations and have authoritative multilingual dictionaries in place before translators start the first line of text in that project. In this type of environment, authors use the right term the first time without wasting time on research and negotiation. And in the most sophisticated authoring environments, authors can run an automatic check to make absolutely sure they're using the right terms. And that not only helps authors produce higher quality text faster, quite frankly, 
it makes their work also more enjoyable. The same is true for editors. When authors use the right terms the first time, editors can focus on the type of work they do best and enjoy most. And that is improving tone, voice, and messaging. And they too deliver higher quality projects faster. Now ask any translator, well, any technical translator, how their work would change if they had a comprehensive, project-specific, multilingual term base available at the beginning of a project and that they would not have to worry about terminology at all. I guarantee you that they'll say something along the lines of, that would be a total game changer. With project-specific terminology available, translators have something that they typically don't have. The assurance that they're using the same translated term that everyone else in the project is using. And that translates not only into peace of mind, but also higher, higher translation quality and productivity. Finally, let's take a look how the translation reviewer's job changes with end-to-end -end terminology management. Remember, without terminology management, one of the key roles of a translation reviewer is to make sure that the various translators in a project use the correct term translations consistently within and across project. But really, what translation reviewers should be doing is make sure that the translated text sounds and reads as fluent as a, as a translation possibly can. And with terminology managed, reviewers can, sp can spend much more time on that task than without. So proactive, systematic, project-specific, end-to-end terminology management has a significant positive impact on the entire content lifecycle, and not only improves content quality, but holds the very real promise of getting products to market faster. Here is another factoid about my professional life. I have worked for more than a decade in life science translation and localization both on the client and the vendor side. And one of the things that's very different in translation for say a medical device company as compared to a software company is that quality really is job number one. In these types of translation projects, if you get it wrong, literally people's health and life are at stake. That's why organizations in this regulated industry go to great lengths to ensure the highest possible translation quality. They insist on multiple rounds of QA, often including back translation, and I believe that there are more terminologists in the medical field than in any other industry. But speed also matters in the life sciences, and for the same reason as quality, because people's health and life are at stake. The project I want to share with you now is one that I'm particularly proud of and for two reasons. The first is that I use terminology management and some other trickery to make a client very happy. And the second reason is that it practically costs nothing to make that change happen. And that made the client even happier. So let's talk about the specifics. The client is a company that many of you are probably familiar with. They are a very successful provider of medical imaging technology. And any company operating in the life science field has a legal obligation to notify their clients as soon as there is evidence that a device or therapy has an adverse effect. These client communications are called field safety notes. And they are simple documents and at the client in question, they were five to 15 pages long. When I joined the project, it took a minimum of five days to complete this type of project, despite the fact that the entire teams of the agencies uh, most experienced translators and reviewers worked on these projects. The workflow for these field safety note translations that you see on the slide is of course somewhat simplified. As you can imagine, any rush project involving multiple translators per language in more than a dozen languages requires quite a bit of project management and navigating different time zones. Here are the main phases these projects went through. And overall, it's a pretty standard process. You have translation, followed by vendor translation review, a step that is particularly important in this process 
because it ensures the accuracy of these translations and terminological and stylistic consistency across the multiple translators per language these projects require. And quite honestly, both translation and review were already pretty streamlined processes when I joined. The part that was frustrating for everyone was that translators were sitting idle during the time it took to do desktop publishing and have the client's in-country teams review the translated documents in layout. So the first thing I did was take a close look at the corrections that the client's in-country teams made. And not surprisingly, the vast majority of change requests concerned terminology. As is typical with Rush projects, where there is even less time than usual for proper terminology research. Apart from terminology, most change requests were preferential style changes. So my first question to the client was, could you live with a situation where we would not make the requested style changes if that reduced turnaround time? And the client's answer was yes. My next question was, would you be willing to work with us on creating a set of document templates that the authors of the field service notes would use to eliminate the need to do DTP work for each document going forward? And the client's response was yes. Now, the last and most daring question was, based on our findings that in these simple documents, there never were any serious mistranslations that made it past the vendor review, would you be willing to eliminate client translation review if we found a solution to the terminology issue? And after much soul searching, the client's answer was, let's give it a try. So here is the new workflow for the translation of field safety notes that we successfully tested and implemented for this client. Project initiation remained pretty much the same and translation and translators will start translating immediately after the source document is received. The first big change is that upon receipt of the source document, one linguist in each language team to be sure that they don't miss any manually extracts all source terms and compiles them in a glossary, adds the translated terms available from previous projects, researches unknown terms, and adds and highlights those term translations to make sure the reviewer on the client side immediately notices the new term translations that require the most attention. In the next phase, in-country client subject matter experts review only the project glossary of typically a dozen term pays and make any necessary changes. And then the validated glossary is immediately returned to the translation teams. By the time the validated glossary is received, the project is typically late in the vendor review stage and implementing the client's preferred terminology is one of the last steps the reviewers perform before the project is delivered to the client for distribution. Replacing client translation review with client terminology only review and eliminating desktop publishing through the use of pre-formatted document templates reduce translation turnaround time for these critically important quality sensitive translation projects from a minimum of five days to as short as three days, which the client considered a breakthrough achievement. Now, let me emphasize that while it's almost always a good idea to use document templates or even better, author in a structured environment, replacing translation review with terminology only review is not a model that is easily transferable to other types of translation projects. As mentioned before, field safety nodes are, from a content point of view, very simple documents in which nuance and ambiguity are not an issue. At the same time, this process improvement project is an excellent example of how moving terminology management upstream and having the client validate translated terminology early can have a dramatic impact on turnaround time without increasing cost or requiring any changes in tooling. Now, let me talk about another benefit of systematic terminology management. 
And this benefit is probably another one that doesn't come up in conversations a lot. And the reason why I mention it today is also closely linked to my personal biography. But first, you and I may not agree, but for many, translation is a commodity, a service that doesn't differ much from one provider to another. And one way to stand out from the crowd is managing terminology and doing it well. I learned this lesson from none other than Scott McNeely, who was my first boss, or my boss's boss's boss, to be precise. Uh, and he was in, that was in my first job, uh, fresh out of grad school, when I worked as the first terminologist that a small outfit called Java Software, then a division of Sun Microsystems, ever hired. And Scott, as the CEO, would use every opportunity to share his view of the world and how to succeed in it. If you run a search for McNeely Doctrine, you will probably find several. But this is the one that most resonated with me at the time. And if there is one secret to my success as a linguist, it's following Scott's advice, which in a nutshell is this. Find the strategy that's contro controversial and get really good at it. And that's an excellent way to differentiate yourself from the competition. Now, you may say terminology management is not really controversial. Everybody agrees it's a content management best practice. And to that I would say, yes, everybody agrees that terminology management is a great idea. It's the part where you put that theory to practice that's controversial. To the best of my knowledge, there are very few organizations of any size where end-to-end -end terminology management is a mandatory part of every product launch. I've listed just a few of the reasons, uh, and there are many more, why organizations are not managing terminology in a systematic manner. A widespread attitude seems to be, don't have time for that, don't know how to do it. Everyone's busy and has multiple priorities, so it's hard to fit in yet another task, especially one that's not part of people's job description. And what's worse, terminology management is typically not part of people's training. And that's true even for many, if not most, translators. Next is the thinking that terminology is exclusively a translation challenge. So localization managers, managers will say to their agency, terminology, that's your problem. You're the language experts, you figure it out. And another common reason why terminology management doesn't get the attention it deserves is quite frankly, that it's considered a nice to have because the full potential that systematic terminology management offers is not recognized. And finally, end-to-end -end terminology management on an organization-wide scale is a daunting task, even for experienced terminologists. So understandably, most people are simply overwhelmed by the scope and complexity of the task. By the same token, for most organizations, terminology management presents a huge opportunity to stand out. The last benefit of managing terminology that I want to mention is not really new, even though for me personally, it's one that I'm talking about publicly for the first time. We all know that language is constantly changing. New words come into prominence and others disappear. But now is a time where one aspect of language is getting a lot of attention. And that is how we talk about ethnicity, religion, gender, mental and physical ability, age, and other social and cultural characteristics. In the United States and elsewhere, using inclusive language in customer communications has become a high priority in recent months. In fact, many large organizations also prioritize inclusive language in communications with their own workforce. And this type of culture change is a huge challenge for an organization of any size, let alone one with hundreds of content creators. Because once an organization has a policy in place to use inclusive language, how do you make sure that all new content is reflective of this change? How do you update all relevant existing content? And how do you review all that content 
without completely overburdening your authors and editors. The ability to assist authors in adopting inclusive language quickly is yet another major benefit of implementing a terminology management program. And creating an inclusive dictionary has actually been my largest project for my current employer. We published that dictionary in December of last year after months of conversations with dozens of internal and external stakeholders. In fact, our terminology team consulted more than 70 individuals and groups in the process of creating our diversity and inclusion dictionary. And now that this dictionary is available, authors and editors can push a button in their authoring environment to run an automatic check to make sure their content complies with inclusive language and all other terminology and style guidelines before that content goes live. For those of you who have developed an appetite for terminology management in the last 30 minutes, or who have had that appetite even before this presentation, I have a few quick recommendations for starting a terminology management project that don't require a big investment in technology and staff. And I want to say it loud and clear. If you want to launch a company-wide end-to-end terminology management program, that effort will require a substantial investment in both people and technical resources. And rolling out this type of program will also take time. So if implementing a corporate terminology program is already on your strategic roadmap, my recommendation is to hire an experienced terminology consultant to develop a customized solution for your business. The following tips are meant for those of you who don't have access to big resources yet, but want to use the power of terminology management to streamline the launch of an upcoming project or build a business case for a future corporate terminology program. If you are a localization manager and you have always wanted to manage terminology more systematically, but, never, there, were, but there was never enough time to do it, the best advice I can give you is this. Get involved in the document lifecycle earlier, ideally in the content planning stage. As you all know perfectly well, once a localization project goes out the door to the vendor, it's almost always too late to compile a comprehensive project-specific term base, have it translated into all the languages you cover, get feedback on those term translations from the regions, and do all that before the translation of content begins. So if there is a content strategy team or a group that manages the launch calendar of your organization, ask for a seat at the table. We have no terminology management system, no staff to manage terminology, no budget for terminology related activities. So there is no way I can manage terminology. This statement is as common as I believe it's wrong. If you really look hard for them, you might be surprised by how many terminology resources you may find. Your authors might not have a shared term base, but individual authors and especially editors probably have their own personal glossaries hidden somewhere. Your legal department should keep a list of all your trademarks and the terms in author glossaries and trademark lists make a great starter dictionary. And if you're still uncomfortable building a term base yourself, after I told you that all it is is a collection of the words that matter in your organization, I'm sure there are people in your organization that compile and work with word lists on a daily basis and who would be very comfortable taking on a terminology project. Speaking of terminology resources, once you find or create a term base, and it doesn't matter if that term base is only in one language, please share this resource with your partners, externally and internally. Making one writer's cheat sheet available to all writers will make authoring and editing easier for the entire organization. All it takes to make that happen from a technology point of view is a document that's stored and maintained on a shared drive. And when, when it comes to sharing term bases or glossaries with your translation vendors, make sure that you're spreading the wealth across all vendor, vendors. I'm thinking in particular of video localization, 
or even with a centralized translation management system in place, translators may not have access to that system. Another piece of advice I'd give to anyone starting out in terminology management is this. A smaller project is probably a better candidate than your biggest mission-critical launch. With a lower priority launch, you and everyone else involved in that project may be under a lot less pressure, and both you and your collaborators probably have more of an opportunity to experiment with tools and processes. And now that you know that you don't need a lot of resources for your first terminology project, and that you may not have to do all the work yourself, a great way to get started with terminology management is, well, to get started. And here's how I would do it. I'd run a pilot on a small project, collect as much data as possible on the positive impact terminology has had on that project, share that data with management and colleagues, and have everyone ask for more. And that's when you build the business case for a terminology management program and ask for the resources it takes to deploy an organization-wide solution. Rolling out a terminology management program is a journey. And like all journeys, it starts with a first step. Okay, so what are the three steps, sorry, what are the three things I want you to take away from this session? First, managing terminology is about much more than just being consistent. Terminology management has real business value and may help you get your products to market faster. Second, terminology management is not rocket science. It's about giving authors and translators guidance on how to use the words that matter most in your organization. And finally, you now know everything there is to know to start your first terminology project. So do take that first step. Thank you very much for your attention and back to you, Adrian. Hi, everyone. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hello, hello, hello. This is my grandma, Peg. Hi. Really excited to see everyone joining the GRC and having so many great global customers involved. One of the reasons why I like working here so much is the truly global nature of our customer base. So I get to interact with people from different backgrounds each and every day and no two days are the same. I love working with smiling project managers because they are friendly and always ready to help. What I particularly like about localization is that you know that your work is out there helping people whether it's their business, fun, education, or getting from A to B. I love working at Smartling because it allows me to spend time with my family when I need to, but I'm also grateful to see the way localization impacts the world and Smartling's role in that. My favorite thing about working at Smartling has got to be the people. Working with such a great team has definitely, without a shadow of a doubt, made the past year so much easier. I love translating because it allows me to help companies expand to new markets. I'm speaking to you from the Cayman Islands. I am Smartling's number one UK English translator. I've been working with Smartling for eight years and I could not wish for a better team. I love the variety of interesting content. Right from the start, I knew that this was a special place to be. I love working at Smartling because I know that I will learn something new every single day I come to work. And it's really nice because it gives me the opportunity to translate very interesting materials. I'm privileged to work with the most wonderful colleagues that all share the same passion for Smartling and all things localization as I do. And of course, with the best customers in the world, with whom it's an honor to partner. I love languages, researching, and sports. The people here really care about one another, their clients, and the quality of the work that they're putting their names on day in and day out to serve you and ultimately your customers. The resilience of the team over the past 12 months has been remarkable. Um, at a time we were all forced apart, we all pulled together um, and had a bit of a laugh along the way. Something good that happened last year was that I started learning video game development, which is something completely new for me. Something good that happened to me last year was that I got my first video game localization project and that I joined a yoga practice group with colleagues from all around the world. I've been able to spend a bit more time with my husband and two cats, do a bit of drawing and photography and start learning the highway code. One big exciting thing that happened for me and my family this year was that we welcomed a new baby boy to our family um, back in November. So 
added a little Benji to our family, so very excited about that. During the lockdown in the last year, what kept me going has been looking out of the window and enjoying the mountains. I started working out every day and it feels really good. I discovered a new hobby, which is preparing homemade bread. I hope the rest of the conference goes well and I hope to be speaking with some of you uh, as we go along. I hope you're all enjoying this year's virtual Global Ready Conference and learning loads of the topics up for discussion today. Enjoy every minute. Thank you. See you.